about thinking of your child and thinking of yourself in some respects as, as accumulating a toolbox of skills. And what success really seems to boil down to, according to the best data and the, the people who study this the most, is people who have really useful toolboxes, people who develop skills, understandings, knowledge bases, right, that enable them to contribute to the world in some positive way. And then we'll end with just um, some fun things about um, what to sort of expect moving forward. So first I want to be incredibly clear. I'm not an admissions expert, right? But I have been at retreats at, with uh, the president of the leadership at Princeton, Dartmouth, Skidmore, Union, a bunch of places over the last year where we've sat down and talked about with leadership, who should we let in, why should we let those people in, stuff like that. And at those places as well, I said, I'm not an admissions expert. Don't, they kept saying, don't look at me. But I am a theorist, and hopefully that theorist will help. So I'm going to start out by saying this, that the world is just, it's complex. And I mean that in a formal sense. So this is the situation in Afghanistan, according to our government. Easy solution, right? And if you look at something like this, what you see is all these different fields. So there's political things going on, there's sociological things going on, there's technical things going on, there's drug trades going on, there's the infrastructure and the economy going on. So, if you wanted to say what's going on in Afghanistan, there's no way one person could really understand it. So one of the big themes is, when you talk about teams and cohorts and contributing, it's not like we, we no longer go to the expert, right? We go to teams of experts. So success in the modern world consists of somehow having some set of tools that allows you to be part of a team that could help people make sense of this sort of stuff. There's something called Google Ngram, which actually started at the University of Michigan. What they did is they paid people to come and just basically read all of the books at U of M into a photocopier and copy down all the words of all the books. Right? And Michigan allowed them to do this. And you can see sort of what the frequency of different words are. Now, what's fun about this is the frequency of the word intelligence in all books has pretty much stayed constant and then gone down a little bit since 1980. As my wife, Shoga teacher, used to say, label that a thought, put it away. Um, but if you think of like diversity in team, right, these things have been on a huge upswing, right, since 1960, and complexity has as well. And that's not coincidental, right? The reason that's the case is because of complexity, we need teams and we need diversity, right? So we need diverse people to sort of handle the fact that we've got complex problems. So I have a book coming out. This is a shameless plug for my book that comes out November 29. But it's more the case that, um, to give you just a sense of kind of what I do, is I try to use these models, as we'll do today, to make sense of the world. I was um, at something the other day, and somebody says, you know, we're buying 50 copies of this book. You know, you can send your kid to college. And I said, you know, make a dollar a book. So like, he can take a cooking class or something online, right? So the point of this is not self-promotion. The idea is that, you know, we want to get these ideas out. But when you construct models, there's simplification. So this is Picasso's model of a bull. That's all the important parts. Right? And so because models are simple and the world is complex, the way we try and make sense of the world is to use many models, right? To have many frames. So three weeks ago I was at the CIA and we were talking about, you know, what ensembles of the models do they use to try and make sense of things from an intelligence perspective. Then the next week I was at um, the Congressional Budget Office and we're sitting around saying, when you're evaluating like a health care plan, how many models do you use, right? why each model has blind spots, that sort of stuff. So when we frame this, when we try and make sense of the world, we sort of begin with something called the wisdom hierarchy, which, which actually comes from this famous quote by T.S. Eliot, where he says, where's the wisdom we've lost in knowledge? Where's the knowledge we've lost in information? And the way we think of this is the following. People talk about living in a data-rich world, this being the age of data. So you can think of data as just all those things that Amazon has and Google has, or credit card companies, everything that's out there, all this sort of health data, everything that sits out there. On top of data is what we call information. So Michigan has an information school, people talk about artificial information. What you're doing is you're taking that data and you're sort of grouping it in buckets. So when we say something like unemployment has gone up, or the stock market fell, what we're doing is we're aggregating data into like nouns, right? that sort of help us make sense of things. Because there's just too much data to make sense of stuff, so we put it in these little bins. When we think about knowledge, what that is is sort of understandings between pieces of information, things like force equals mass times acceleration, right, that you learn in a physics class, or supply equals demand in an economics class. And when we think about wisdom, we think about wisdom as sort of 
having a whole bunch of knowledge and then figuring out which knowledge I apply in which setting, right? So when we think about what, is, what does success mean or what, is, what enables someone to sort of be successful and make a contribution, what it typically means is, you know, gathering or acquiring a whole bunch of knowledge, right? So you, or pieces of knowledge, you, you have ways of understanding things. And then, through experience and through time, accumulating wisdom so you know which knowledge you want to apply. So what we want to do today is sort of like talk about some knowledge about the college selection process and hopefully achieve some wisdom. Now, there's a catch in here, and sometimes the knowledge is going to kind of contradict itself, right? So there's going to be paradoxes, right? And so we just have to sort of absorb those. So let's start by a couple models in terms of how we think about students, right? So these are students at Green Hills where they teach listening skills. <laughs> and when we think about, okay, how do I evaluate students, it's, it's worth thinking about how historically we evaluated people. So this is a Northern Michigan logging camp. I use this slide a lot. When they would hire people at Michigan, Northern Michigan logging camps, what they would do is they would see how many trees they could cut, chop down, right? This was your ability, right? So if you could chop down 12 trees, that's like having a higher SAT score than someone can only chop down eight trees. But that's not all they did. They also counted your teeth. <laughs> because you had to be able to eat enough meat to get enough protein to chop down trees the next day. So if you think about your kids applying to college, you've kind of got like, well, what's her GPA? What's her SAT score? Back then it was like, how many trees? How many teeth? Right? Add those up, and that's kind of your score. So if you have a lot of teeth and a lot of trees, you're going to get to the Princeton of tree chopping down. Right? <laughs> the point of this, this seems super silly, and it's meant to be silly, is that we're doing the same thing sometimes with our kids. I think this is a mistake. I mean, I have two boys. They're high-dimensional, complex things. And we're kind of projecting them down into two dimensions, some sort of grade point average and test scores. That's crazy, right? They're much more complicated and sophisticated than that. So we need to sort of enlarge how we think about them. And yet, there are these sort of measuring stick approaches where we sort of say, OK, well, my student has an SAT score, has a GPA, he took AP tests or whatever, he has extracurriculars, there's letters of recommendation, and then detentions are in red, they've got a certain number of detentions. Um, and then you think, you sort of have this view that this is what admissions departments do, that they sort of like have some sort of score where they just add these things up and maybe subtract off the detentions. And sometimes when you read on the, in, um, on the web or talk to people, they'll sort of say, oh, this is, there's something called holistic review, and this is what they do. And this isn't quite what we do. So one of the things we want that they do. So what we want is we want to sort of um, move away from this a little bit. And the way we're going to move away from this is instead take much more of a toolbox approach. And instead say, rather than think of our, you know, children applying to colleges like SAT score, grade point average, that sort of stuff, you want to think of them having a whole bunch of attributes that don't really have rankings. So maybe they're qualitative, maybe they're quantitative, maybe they're interested in anthropology, right? Maybe they had a whole bunch of experiences volunteering somewhere. Maybe they got all these skills as a musician, right? So when these schools are looking at students, yeah, there's a little bit of this in the holistic review, but there's a lot of this, right? So if you look at a place like um, Princeton, for example, is a good example just because they have lots of applicants and lots of data. With all their applicants, they'll sort of take this sort of score, right, this thing, and they can predict, can you make it at Princeton? Well, of their applicants, the vast majority of them can make it at Princeton, right? So then what they're doing is they're then saying, okay, of the people who can make it at Princeton, which is most of them, who is kind of doing interesting stuff and is going to give us an interesting cohort? So have that idea in mind that like you can think of your student as a measuring stick, which is an oversimplification, or you can think of your student as sort of this vector of things that they're interested in, which is probably more accurate. We're going to do the same with colleges. So when you think about picking a college, right, when we're doing this with, as our sons have been going through this, this is what people in my space, we try to make things sound as boring as possible. So we call this a multi-dimensional choice problem, right? And we say, you can think of a college as like a vector of attributes, just like you think of students, like X, Y, and Z. And we've got the same sort of measuring thing. There's a hedonic choice model of colleges. So each college has attributes where having more of something is better. So a college has an average SAT, an average GPA, an endowment, faculty student ratios, class size. And everything in green, oh, those are better things to have. And everything in red, it's better to have smaller numbers, right? You have a smaller faculty student ratio, you have smaller class sizes. And so when you look at these college guidebooks, 
you're looking at this sort of information, you're saying, oh, is one college better than another? So if you looked up Middlebury, you'd say, oh, the average SAT is set 1450, the GPA is 3.95, it's got a billion dollar endowment, it's a lot of money. Average faculty, this faculty student ratio is eight to one. Class size, 68% of the classes have 19 people in it. We're gonna come back to that and Betsy's gonna go completely crazy over there because you should have a shared passion for this number 19 that'll become clear later in the talk. If you look at Union College, they have a lower SAT, lower GPA, lower endowment, higher faculty student ratio, and the same on class size. So you might be, we're gonna come back to this later as well. So you might, if you had this view of the world, this sort of measuring stick view, you might say, oh, Middlebury's a better college than Union. But this is kind of like the trees plus teeth thing again, right? <laughs> we're sort of taking this really complex thing, a college, Union College has been around since 18th century, and reducing it to five numbers. I can do the same with WashU and Williams, but if I do this, WashU kind of wins on the green thing, SAT, GPA, and endowment. It's got seven and a half billion dollars in there. But it loses on faculty-student ratio, and it loses on average class size, right? And so then you're like, okay, now what do I do? Because in this case, I could say, oh, Middlebury's better on everything. And here I kind of got, ooh, one's better here, one's better than that. So U.S. News and World Report has come in and solved this for us, he says, <laughs> very cynically. You can hear the laughter from that side of the room. And what they do is they have a linear weighting, okay, where they just put weights on these things. So here's where every person who does data kind of goes completely crazy. So there's something called linear regression, where what you do is you sort of have data, and then you have actual data on the outcomes, and then you estimate what these coefficients should be based on, like, real outcomes. But if you can't, but there's no real value to each school. Like there's nothing, there's no way to sort of say this is how good the school is. So you can't really get weights on these things. So what US News and World Report does is just makes them up. These make them up. And you can tell they're made up because they're all numbers like 50%, 35%, 15%, 50. So they just made up numbers for these things. Basically, so initially just this guy sat around and said, here's what makes a good college, and these are my weights. And one of the things that's great about this is class size 1 to 19, U.S. News and World Report uses this, right? U of M ends up being ranked fourth among public universities. But this is a really funny thing, is there's no evidence that when you put the 20th student in the class, <laughs> it just falls apart. Nobody learns anything. <laughs> it's over, right? So Michigan did a test a couple years ago. We took a whole bunch of classes where we had 19 and 20, and we did every possible metric that we could find, because there are a difference in learning outcomes, the answer is no, right? So we responded by that, but we build new buildings, we make sure that the rooms only hold 19 students. <laughs> Why? So that we only have 19 students in the class, so that this number is really, really big, right? That's why when you go back, remember these things I showed you? Class size 19, why can I find this data? Because everybody publishes this data, because they don't want US News and World Report to actually have to work very hard to plug that into their formula, so they could be ranked really highly, right? A couple of schools have basically thumbed their nose at U.S. News Report and had these huge classes with 21 students, <laughs> right? Nobody's learned anything and their rating has suffered, okay? Now, you could come up with different ways and you could say maybe these things don't matter, right? So there's something called Niche Magazine. Now it's kind of ironic, a magazine called Niche, which is about like finding your place in the world, like rank things, but that goes well. Michigan ends up number one, and that's because academics count 40%, right? In U.S. News and World Report, it only counts 22%. Having a campus designed by Thomas Jefferson counts for a lot more, so Virginia leaps above. <laughs> I'm not joking, right? So architecture matters more. So who beats us in the other one? Berkeley, UCLA, and Virginia, right? Michigan has a pretty campus. I've been to Berkeley, UCLA, and Virginia. They're prettier. Right? So if you care about pretty, we're four. Care about academics, we're one, right? But this 22.5%, that was scientifically derived. No. That's also made up, right? So this is made up by US News and World Report. This 40% is made up by Niche Magazine, right? So what they're doing is these are people, they're doing their best, right? They're kind of saying, here's what we think matters. When you do this, you get different ratings. But let's go to a different model. So that's model one. That's kind of the trees and teeth model. The other model is this kind of like this spatial model. And the spatial model is like everybody has a preferred choice, right? So if I go buy a burrito, it's not that like 
the hotter the burrito, the better it is, right? There's some ideal point in heat space on how hot I want the burrito. Like for me, it may be here. For my younger son, Cooper, it may be way over here. Like if he can eat hot food that I can't even fathom, right? So now I look at a college and I say, well, how many students do they have? Is it urban or rural? Do you travel aboard? Do you, uh, do you write a thesis? Neither answer to these things is better, right? It could be traveling aboard is good. It could be it's not so good. It could be rural is good. It could be urban is good. Big could be good. Small could be good, right? So one student could say, well, I'd like to go to campus, a school where there's 40,000 students, where it's urban, where you can travel aboard, but I don't want to write a thesis. Somebody else could say, I want a small or rural school where you travel, and I do want to write a thesis. And so then, Student A should go to Wisconsin, and student B should go to Skidmore, right? And it's not that Wisconsin is better than Skidmore, or Skidmore is better than Wisconsin, right? They're different. It's kind of like, I would like to go to Pizza House, and my family would like to go to Cottage Inn, right? They're, I, mean, I can think they're wrong, but they're not wrong. They just have different preferences. They seem to like bad pizza. <laughs> so, so if we go back to the Middlebury Union thing, right? Before, I was like, oh, no, look, Middlebury's better than Union, right? Because that's because I was doing this sort of like measuring stick thing. But like Union has my friend David Harris as president, <laughs> which is a great thing. Like somebody said, I've never seen two people so happy. And I'm like, that's right, because David's president, he was just named president of Union College, so he had me in for his inauguration. He's happy he's president of Union College. I'm happy he's president of Union College. He's happy I'm not president of the Union College, and I'm happy I'm not president of the Union College. So everybody's super happy there. And if you look at Union College, I said to David, so David was a professor here, then he was an administrator at Tufts, at, or at, at Cornell, then he was provost at Tufts. And he could have been anywhere, right? He, you know, he was on the list to be president at almost any school. And I'm like, so David, why Union? And Union's in Schenectady, New York, and he's like, it's this amazing school. So Union is a very old school, it's one of the oldest schools in the country, and it's one of the few engineering schools where all the engineers and all the liberal arts students take the same core curriculum. So this is a school that's got a strong core curriculum. So if you like a strong core curriculum, if you like cottage and pizza, or if you like whatever you like, this is a great place to go. Um, it has a really strong first-year writing program, which a lot of engineering schools don't do. And also, what if they do do, it's not shared with the liberal arts school. So you're like kind of learning to write with engineers, which is probably not the best peer group, right? <laughs> no, you'd rather be learning to write with English majors. And then everybody's sophomore year is a research program. So like, you know, he would use the phrase, punch above their weight, but they do sort of punch above their weight in terms of sending people off to research careers, right? So Union College isn't like, so if you, but I was at Union, I'd been at Skidmore just before this, and you know, Skidmore has a completely different feel. Skidmore has more of a sort of a business design focus. But if I just looked at the numbers, Skidmore and Union would look very similar, right? But it's kind of like the difference between like a French restaurant and a German restaurant when you're actually there. They're very different places. So this measuring stick approach suddenly doesn't look like it makes very much sense, right? So Andrew Martin, who had been the dean of LSNA at the University of Michigan, just became president of Washington University. And so I said to Andrew, I said, I'm going to Green Hills, I'm giving this talk. This is your moment to push Washington University like crazy. And so here's what he said. He said, he goes, oh, I want you to quote me exactly, so I will. He said, Washington University is a place where we aspire to know every student by name and story. I think that's copyrighted. Mm -hmm. And with 7,500 undergraduate students, there's a deep commitment to one-on-one -on -one academic advising and undergraduate teaching and research among the tenure track faculty. And that aspiration and scale gives it an individualized academic and personal development experience, community, immediately impact the campus and community. Right? So this is kind of like, Wash U, and that's very different than looking in terms of the scores, right? What Wash U is trying to do is sort of have individual focus on the students and force their tenure, and sort of encourage their tenure track faculty to work closely with students. So the summary here is the hedonic model is sort of like you look up U.S. News and World Report, you think, how good is the school I'm going to? The spatial model is saying, now this is about kind of finding a good fit, you know, finding a match, right? Neither one of these is necessarily right, but the spatial model probably has, you know, a little bit more weight. And your college choice should include both, right? You should think about, I want to go to a place that, you know, sort of fits me academically, but it's kind of be kind of equally important, we'll talk about why, that you're working on this match dimension. So some dimensions are clearly going to be hedonic, right? Like average test score, those sort of things, and other things like urban rural are clearly going to be spatial. 
So when these schools are letting people in, here's the thing that I've, this would have been kind of um, fun, I think, for a lot of us to learn, is I, th I think we tend to think like, they've got this list of students, and they're ranking them like by trees and teeth, right? So the best ones are getting in, it's like, oh gosh, your kid has more teeth than mine. It's gonna get into that better school, right? It's kind of that, but it's much more that they're looking at, you know, how do we put together a cohort of students? How do we bring in a group of students that collectively is going to do really interesting stuff? So in 1964, Princeton wasn't very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> right? In fact, they were horrible at that. Um, this is the Volkswagen board, right? And so you'll go to places and they'll say, like, we are a meritocracy, but then, um, but they're not, right? I mean, so the thing is what you want to look at, you want to think sort of, what decisions are we making to bring people in? So my own work, I'm going to give you two papers on this. This is kind of academic stuff. My own work with Lou Hong is that here's sort of a really interesting thing. Suppose that if people are chopping down trees and are putting together who would be able to chop down trees, I would take the people who are best at chopping down trees, right? If I'm putting together a four by 100 relay race, I would choose the four fastest people, right? But here's a funny thing. So we were doing some mathematical work on, on people who solve problems, which is what people do in the economy these days. And we said, suppose there's a difficult problem. And suppose I take a group of diverse problem solvers who are kind of smart, and I put them in teams. Now, this is a mathematical model. And what we found is you're actually better off randomly choosing teams than choosing the teams of the best according to some like US News and World Report ranking. Which is weird, but then when you think about it, the reason why is, is that when you use the ranking, you end up getting people who are really smart, in quotes, but they're similar. So when I take the 10 people who score best, they tend to be similar people. So a friend of mine became president at Cornell, and she said, you know, I really want to push interdisciplinarity, I want to diversify the school, would you come up and talk to us at Cornell? And I said, fine. I'm about to come, and this guy, John Kleinberg, who won a MacArthur Genius Award, so that means he's smarter than me. Um, he said, I'm taking one of my smartest graduate students, and we're going to go after this theorem. Because it just can't be right. right? And this is kind of what academics do. You sort of go after each other's work. So together with Maitha Raghu, right, um, he wrote this paper in 2015 that says, let's think of people who solve problems. It's like when I ask, you know, Nadine and I are asked to solve a problem. We each come in the room and we sort of dump our ideas on the floor. Right? So you get a bunch of ideas. So a mathematician calls this a distribution of solutions. And then what happens is we do stuff for those distributions of solutions. So we have those ideas that we have and create something new. So what they find in this paper is if what we do is nonlinear, something other than add them up, like chopping down trees or running a relay race, then not only does the best team not consist of the people who had the most ideas, there is no test that you can apply to individuals that gives you the best team. So let's think about what this means. It means that Lou and I were wrong because what we said was actually weaker than what is the case. If you're hiring people to solve problems, there's no test you can give where the highest scoring people give you the best teams. The reason why is you want diverse people, right? You want people who've got different skills, different understanding, different knowledge, right? So then Lou and I have another paper that generalizes their paper just because that's what you have to do, right? But the point is, it's kind of a fool's game. If it's simple, if you're running a relay race, chopping down trees, yes, the best team is going to consist of the best people. If you're sequencing a gene, if you're figuring out the thing in Afghanistan, right, you need people who've got diverse understandings, diverse backgrounds, diverse knowledge, that sort of stuff. And so once the problem becomes nonlinear, once you're in this complex space, that's why when you saw that graph about complexity, diversity, teams, once the problem becomes complex, the best group is going to consist of a diverse set of people. That's why we get a place like Green Hills that are constantly trying to get a diverse set of people in the school. Now you could say, let's, let's make this, let's really test this with real people and make it, and prove that Scott and John and Mithra and Lou have to be wrong, which is what they did at Microsoft, right? This is a guy who's smarter than both. And actually, a guy and a woman, in each case, it's funny, it's a guy and a woman. And in each case, the people get smarter, the results get more compelling. So they said, let's take an IQ test Let's take the gold standard IQ test, the Raven's Progressive Matrix test. So you have to figure out which comes next. This is the IQ test that loads best, correlates best with all other IQ tests. Let's take the most homogeneous group we can possibly find anywhere in the world 
it turns out to be British schoolboys. Okay? <laughs> Let's take British schoolboys on the IQ test, create teams of British schoolboys on the IQ test, and it's got to be the case that the teams of the best performing British schoolboys on the IQ test consist of the best, the highest IQ boys, right? So I'm going to give them a test. Take the smartest ones, have them work as teams, and the best teams will be the smartest ones. Nope. Not true. So here's individual IQ from 55 to 145. This is contextual IQ. So what is contextual IQ? It's saying, so I have, so have an IQ of 115, which is a really good IQ. Some people without an IQ of 115 basically get everything right that everybody else gets right. Some of them have an IQ of 115 get questions wrong that other people get wrong. So when you put together people on an IQ test, your own IQ score is how many questions you get right. But when I've got three people working together on an IQ test, what do I want? I want people who are going to get the questions right when the other people get the questions wrong. So there's a, there's a fairly good correlation between IQ and contextual IQ. But if you're picking the best team, you'd actually want to pick like this person, this person, this person, this person. You know, you pick kind of these people, you would skip these people down here because they're not that very good with contextual IQ. So there's a correlation, right? And if you look at the first half of the test and the second half of the test, this is contextual IQ in the first half, this is the contextual IQ in the second half, you get an R squared of 0.9, which means that they're basically the same thing. So there really is something called contextual IQ. So like, there's how good you are alone, but when you're working in a group, what matters more is how good you are in the group. So to pull this back, which is kind of amazing, if you're having a team of people take an IQ test, giving them an IQ test is not a good way to pick the team. <laughs> it's a pretty good way, but it's not going to give you the best team. So it's clearly got to be the case that SAT scores are not going to give you the best students in college. But then you can look at other data that's kind of amazing. So this is a study by the NIH, and they looked at all signs. So they did every paper ever published, 24 million papers. They found that teams were more innovative, so teams were better than individuals. They found as you take, homogeneous teams are lousy. As you make teams more diverse, they do better and better and better. But if you make them too diverse, you actually do worse. And that's one of those things that they haven't figured out, like is it because we don't know how to work in diverse teams, or do they have too much diversity? Big surprise, women are more collaborative. Not a big surprise. And the coordination ends up, the more complex the task is, sort of the harder the project was, coordination matters more. So like, that's basically saying things like CERN, the particle collider, things are hard. But here's another sort of interesting thing. They looked at, here's the number of faculty at an institution, and here's kind of the, this is a fancy measure, but this is kind of how diverse are the things they study. And what you see is that these bigger universities, right, there's kind of, this is faculty, not number of students, there's kind of more diversity. So this then becomes an interesting thing to know. Like if you don't know what you want to study, maybe you err on the side of a bigger university. Right, because there's just more stuff. If you do kind of know what you want to study, then maybe you get someplace small. But let's. Get, this is a project I was involved in with the Forsyth Group of England, where you we were trying to figure out the causes of obesity, and again we solved it. <laughs> right, super straightforward. If I dial in on this, all these things have different colors. Some to do with media. Some are sociological. Some are psychological. Some are economic. Some are food. Some are infrastructure. So everything from giant cokes. Right, to lack of sidewalks, to bacteria in your gut, all that stuff right, is responsible for um, the increase in obesity across countries. And what's funny about this is, I put this up a couple weeks ago, and someone at the CIA said, we just got to get the vending machines out of middle schools. I'm like, that's it. <laughs> you know, the silver bullet. No, the point is there is no silver bullet on this thing. Right? These are complex problems, and if you're going to understand it, you need people from all these disciplines. So here's what's happened. This is every paper ever published in 1960, right? This is the number of authors. Every academic piece of research, one, two, three, four, five. Here it is in 2016. Notice these numbers are a lot bigger, 500,000, 200,000. Most have more than five. So this is going to be an absolute key takeaway. You might think, in 1960, like all those white guys from Princeton, right? When they were going to school, they were going to go work alone, and they were going to write papers alone. And that was going to be great. And so it probably made sense to sort of like let people in who had the highest individual scores. Your children are going to go out and they are going to work in teams. And so it's going to be super important, right? And this one of these green tells us a lot of activity-based learning and stuff like that. 
is that they're successful in working in these teams. So one of the skills you want to have is you know, sort of the ability to function well in diverse teams working on problems like diversity because you see this big increase. And honestly, if you boil this down in, like anywhere, so I, looked, I said, what's the weirdest thing people could study? And I thought, spittle, you know, saliva. So this is the growth in interdisciplinary saliva research. <laughs> and salimetrics, which is like the measuring of saliva, kicked in in like 1998. They get these new techniques for measuring the chemical components of saliva. Breakthrough moment, I guess, if you study saliva. Somebody, I'm not making fun of it. I guess I have to be fun of it. <laughs> and so then once they could measure this stuff in a bunch of different dimensions, interdisciplinary research and saliva research, this is 5,000 papers last year in drooling, basically. And, it's, and most of this is done by teams of people, right? So I mean, pick anything, you'll see a chart just like this. Why? Here's why. If you want to get, I just finished a three-year term on the college executive at the university, which means when somebody tries to get tenure, right, we look at their case and we decide whether they get it or not. And one of the things that decides whether you get tenure in a place like Michigan or Stanford or Eastern Michigan or Michigan State anywhere is, do people cite your work? Right, or other people reading your work. And one of the thresholds for that, kind of an arbitrary one, is have 100 people cited one of your papers. So that's considered like a, a really important thing. In both the sciences and in the social sciences, you're four and a half times as likely to write one of those papers if you do it as a team. Four and a half times. That's, and again, this isn't, I want to be very clear, social sciences, so like you've probably read in psychology that there's this like, crisis of replication, that, like you can't, like results people got, you know, people can't replicate. Those are often experiments with like 40 undergraduates that at the end of it somebody got a coffee mug, right? This is 24 million papers. This is every piece of academic research ever written. So this isn't some little fun thing someone did in the lab. This is every piece of scientific research ever written. Teams are four and a half times as likely. Here's the really weird thing. This is where the diversity and engagement part if you hold everything else, if you run a big regression, and you hold everything else constant, and you just switch the schools of one of the people, so as painful as it might be, I like work with someone from Ohio State. My odds of running these papers goes up 10%. If I were a scientist, you know, like a, so a physical scientist, it would go up 7%. Why? Because they know different stuff, right? They're not hanging out in the same hallway I'm hanging out with, you know, right? They know different stuff. The papers like them. This is just amazing work by a, bunch of, a big team of people at Northwestern. Again, all these papers are written by teams. You could say, well, maybe the co-authored papers have more sites because there's more people. You can think of this as representing the size of that box. This box represents, they call this atypical combinations, if you're citing other important work. So this is kind of like a quality box. This box is a diversity box. It's saying, am I citing papers together, ideas together, that nobody has kind of cited together in the past? So if we're, so we're taking psychology plus economics, or there's a guy in Michigan who just won a genius award who was doing forensics and anthropology, right? So suppose I'm combining stuff people have done. So this is like an ability bonus. This is a diversity bonus. This giant green box is what you get if you have ability and diversity. So if you just go by SAT scores, you're kind of going like this. If you just go for diversity, you're going this. If you do ability and diversity, you get this, and this, and that. So what does success come from in scientific breakthrough? Smart people who think differently. Right? And, and again, this isn't a small study. This is 24 million papers. Right? So now let's take this, and let's think about what this means for our kids. Right? You just go back to this toolbox idea, and, like, and this is going to be my friend uh, Joey Ito. So Joey Ito runs the MIT Media Lab, and on, until a month ago, Joey didn't have a college education. Right? He dropped out of college. He's from Detroit. He's one of these many people who dropped out of college in Detroit, never mounted, except for running the MIT Media Lab. But then he, he got a PhD in Japan, kind of working at night, because people in MIT were getting a hard time. Okay, so Joey says this. Here's where everybody's got things wrong. We tend to think that there's all these kids graduate from high school, and then there's some funnel that gets them to a better school, and then there's another funnel that gets them to something else. And then eventually, if you're really good, you can go to Yale Law School and go to the Supreme Court. But the idea is somehow there's a window here. <laughs> right? He says, no, completely backwards. Invert the pyramid. Like, 
as you leave high school, you've got some set of tools and things you know. And what you do is over time, you're just amassing new tools, new understandings, new knowledge bases. You're growing and growing and growing. And then you've got this giant toolbox. And then you use that toolbox to go out and do good in the world. And so if you say to your kid, this is how the world works. You've got to get these grades. You've got to get this thing. And if you don't do this, you're not going to get here. right? That's causing a lot of stress. And also, look, most people don't get there. But if you say to your kids this, look, there's so many things you can learn. What you want to do is you want to go out there, when you go to some college, you go to some university, think about what are all the knowledge, what are the things I can possibly learn, and will those things help me do the things I'd like to do? You invert that pyramid, and you, and you give yourself lots of opportunities to make a difference. So let me explain what I mean by toolboxes. And there's really sort of four categories here. There's explicit academic tools. There's tacit academic tools. So explicit is something that like I could like. Um, write down in an explicit way. Tacit is something like cooking, where you kind of got to do it on your own, you kind of learn by doing it. And then there's personal tools and group tools. So let me give some examples quickly. So explicit academic tools are sort of disciplinary knowledge, right? Chemistry, history, impressionism. And techniques like numerical optimization, DNA sequencing, stuff like that. If you go to science, like if you're in computer science, there's explicit knowledge like how to program in Python. Or if you're in uh, neuroscience, you'll learn how to use these PET machines, which are positron emission to which doesn't sound as much fun as having a pet. If you're in biochemistry, um, you use something called the Bruker SN 400 millihertz NMR with auto sampler. It's kind of a common thing. <laughs> How many people use that? Yeah. You do. There you go. So see? <laughs> that's why she's in the room. <laughs> she can explain this to us later. Right? So that's the whole point. So in a university, right, you want someone. That probably made your night, right? I, I love the NMR. I, I <laughs> there we go, right? And the rest of it. So, so if you go to MIT, you could think, okay, I want to go to MIT and get a certain grade point. But what you really do is you take classes when you go there. When you take a class, like if you take advanced fluid dynamics, you learn these explicit tools, right? So I teach this models class, and tomorrow there's a midterm, and it's over these explicit tools, right? So when those kids walked in, and, and the last question on the midterm is, how many questions could you have answered before, the, before you took the class? And the answer to that is always, Zero, right? And at the, at the midterm, they can answer all these. Like tomorrow, the average score will be probably 80%, and they'll answer a big chunk of these because they've actually learned explicit tools. But here's the, the key part. There's also a set of tacit tools, like deep reading of a text, structuring an argument, organizing a paper presentation, seeing a problem from multiple perspectives, right? There are more sort of things that you sort of learn through experience at college. And even in mathematics, right? Um, this is a wonderful paper by a high school teacher, Paul Lockhart, called The Mathematician's Lament, where he says, like, mathematics isn't about, like, the integral of arc secant, right? It's really the art of explaining things, right? And by doing mathematics, it's funny, I was walking to school today, um, these two grad students were walking um, next in front of me, and I knew they were grad students, because one of them said, wow, you know, when I went to get a PhD in biochemistry, it didn't occur to me I should have taken more theoretical mathematics. And so I said, Excuse me, is it okay if I quote you later today? I can talk to you. <laughs> Fine, who are you talking to? I said, you don't want to know. Okay, so, but the point is, the reason she said she should have taken more theoretical mathematics is just to sort of learn how to construct better arguments. There's also passive, personal tools, like eating, sleeping, and exercising, right? It's so, like, we send these kids out, and then you find out, like, you forgot to eat in college, or maybe you should sleep more. Basic time management skills. So one of the things in the Harvard case that I think is being, Mis misinterpreted is like one of the reasons all these schools take athletes and like having athletes is because the athletes are much better at time management, probably because they've got coaches forcing them to be better at time management. But this is a big issue for a lot of our students at a place like Michigan. And one way we've increased our graduation rates is actually by borrowing from the athletic departments. We've actually had the athletic department teach us with our first generation students, we're basically copying the football program's time management schedule because. It's getting better than ours. Things like just basic note But here's where the cohort thing comes in. There's tacit group tools, like deep listening, collaborating, task allocation, trusting. And then also challenging. This is a really important part. of When I give diversity talks, we talk a lot about this. There's a wonderful book um, called How to Be a Blank Blank Boss. It's got a expensive title. But where she talks about, it's by Jill Scott. She talks about something called radical candor. And when you're in a group of people different from yourself, it's incredibly important you care about those people personally, but it's also important that you challenge them directly. 
So in a lot of, if, if you're different from other people and they're challenging you and you don't think they care about you, you're going to interpret that as obnoxious aggression. Mm -hmm. One of the problems we have at the University of Michigan, to be blunt, is we're so concerned about being inclusive that sometimes we don't want to challenge someone's ideas are different. We end up in this ruinous empathy box, right? Where you want to be is in this radical candor box where there's high levels of trust and high levels of personal care and people like each other, but you're challenging their ideas because where does success come from? It comes from comparing these ideas. So what, are you, what to expect? Let me just end with some simple takeaways and we'll hopefully have some time for conversation. So the first thing is this. Firms hire from many schools and graduate schools admit from many schools. So it's so easy at this point to be like, oh my god, my kid's got to get into school. And I was talking to someone the other night, and their kids are applying early action to, I don't even know the difference between early action and early decision, but whatever it is, to like Georgetown. And the whole family's kind of freaking out. And I'm like, relax, right? Um, here's Andrew Martin again. In my mind, the new president of Washington, the ranking of the school just doesn't matter. I think that's a quote from Animal House or something. <laughs> it just doesn't, is it? It just doesn't matter, just, right? What matters most is the academic environment that matches, so he's purely spatial. And again, this is one of the highest ranked schools in the country, right? Wash U, it's one of the great schools. And he's saying, look, it is matching. What matters most is the academic environment matches the student's interest in learning style, where the student can learn who they are and what they want to do with their lives, right? And you can't rank that. And he put that in all caps. Um, so Google is interesting here. So you might think it's hard to get into Michigan or Harvard or Yale or Michigan State or something. Google gets almost 4 million applicants. That's a lot per year. That's a lot. And so I spent a lot of time with their people team thinking about, like, how do you do this? And one thing they found is, like, interviewing kind of works up to four. So this is, a, if they just use their sort of artificial intelligence things based on resumes, you got a 50, this is someone who's, like, 50% likely to be better than average or not. One interview gets you to 78%, two gets you to 80%, three gets you to 84%, four gets you to 86%, and then it kind of doesn't matter. Now, why more interviews help you is because people are diverse. So different interviewers see different stuff, right? So this is, again, the team is better than the individual. How much better? Well, 86 to 78. So the team is 8% better. And big teams don't help you that much, right? So here's, you might think, oh, Google hires from the Ivy League. Nope. Google is much more likely to hire from public schools, right? So one of my son's friends really wanted to go to Stanford Berkeley, didn't get in, didn't get an MIT, didn't get into Michigan, was stuck going to the University of Illinois. He now works for Google. Not surprising. Why? Because Google has a lot of people from the University of Illinois, right? Um, so when you look down this list, right, a lot of these are more technical schools. The point is with three million applicants, they find that they want to hire people who have been trained in different places. Second thing is, why do they do that? Because employers and schools seek tool diversity. So this is my wife, Jenna Bednar. There she is. Ooh, I probably had a better picture. <laughs> but, um, she teaches this course on state and local politics. And if you ask her, like, why does she want a diverse set of students in her graduate program, when you're teaching state and local politics, if everybody's from Connecticut, people only know about Connecticut. It's not a very interesting discussion, right? Nebraska, it turns out, has something called a unicam. They only have one house, right? And so if you discuss state and local policies, you don't have people from the south, you don't have people from the west, you don't have people from the east, it's not going to be very interesting. So let's go back to Joey, um, who runs the Media Lab at MIT. This is one of the great places to work probably in the world, the Media Lab at MIT, pathbreaking. They have no faculty that went to Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, Columbia, Penn, or Cornell. Zero. Zip. They have one each from Princeton and Brown. They have three that went to MIT, but that's not surprising because it's MIT, right? And they have one. They have two from anywhere else. Illinois, Florida, places I can't pronounce. Georgia Tech, Tufts, Stanford, UAE, Waterloo, Santa Barbara, Millersville, Technicon, Juilliard, and Michigan. Right? Why? So let's go back to MIT's advanced fluid dynamics. Here's the tools you learn. Let's go to Illinois. Here's their advanced fluid dynamics. Wait a minute. At MIT, they teach propellers and windmills and fluid dynamics. Those aren't in water. That doesn't make any sense. The reason they do this, so I ask, the reason they do this is that you can learn about propellers by studying windmills. Right? They don't teach kind of flow around a body in open channels because these are things that like are 
there's a lot of stuff that deal with glaciers that they're interested in Illinois because we're in a glacial place and they're not in, uh, it's like water flowing over rocks is a big thing, both in Michigan and at Wisconsin and in Illinois. They don't care about it much, Massachusetts. So you just study different stuff. So if you're hiring two fluid dynamicists, you're not gonna take two from MMI, you're not gonna take two from MIT, you take two from each, one from each place because you're gonna get a different set of tools. Because these different two schools teach different tools. So look, here's Stanford, this is gonna fascinate me. 11% of the undergraduates major in human biology, 7% biology, so it's 18% biology, right? Here's Chicago, 24% economics, right? So where you go, right, you're just gonna learn different stuff. Fourth thing, tool diversity, so we, there's a lot of talk about identity diversity, tool diversity and identity diversity correlate. There's no necessarily causation between your identity and the tools you can learn, but there is a correlation between the identity diversity and the tools you choose to learn. So if you look at STEM majors, what you see is many more Asians study STEM than do whites, blacks, or Hispanics. And more men study STEM than women, right? So you see these differences. If you look at philosophy by race, right, what you see is not many Asian Americans study philosophy, right? African Americans also is about sort of half their normal rate. But Hispanic is actually sort of approximately where it should be, you know, you know in line with what you'd expect. If you look at by gender, this is Stanford. One reason I put Stanford data up in other schools is Stanford is very open about their data, other places aren't. But in physics, it's 82% men. In human biology, it's 73% women. But here's the funny thing. Human biology is really hard. Physics is really hard. So it's not like this is an easy major and this is a hard major. So if you go through things and ask which is easy, which is hard, there's no correlation with the difficulty of the subject and which ones have men and women, right? It's just, Women tend to be more interested in biology, and men tend to be more interested in like colliding things at high speed. <laughs> okay. Fifth one, and this is really important, is people work with the tools that you acquire. And so when you think of your child going off and they're gonna to go to some place and they're gonna acquire skills, it's more important than where they go to school is having conversations with them about like what classes are you taking? What are you learning? What tools are you gathering, right? So this is one of my favorite charts. Look at the, uh, there's 699 companies that are either in the Fortune 500 or the S&P 500. And you could say, well, if you want to be a CEO, you should go to the Ivy League. And the, C the Ivy League just barely beats the Big Ten. But if you want to be a CFO, right, you're way more likely to be a CFO. This is the you know, financial side of things if you go to the Big Ten. Why is that? Well, there's only one Ivy League school with an undergraduate business school. Work. There's 13 Big Ten schools with undergraduate business schools, right? So if you go study business, you can be a CFO, right? Like there's no way to study accounting at these other schools. So you're probably not going to be a certified financial you know, uh, CFO. So I'm down at NASA, I'm down at um, Huntsville in 2015, on September 26th, the day before they'd announced the people who sit in the seat for the mission to Mars. Okay, rank cool jobs. This is up there, right? So these are the people, and she had been there, so people knew her. It was pretty exciting. Everybody was super excited. So I'm like, where did these people go to school? This is where they went to school. And so I said, wait a minute. Like, did I used to teach at Caltech? I'm like, where's Caltech? And they said, like, where's Michigan? I was like, where is Caltech? You know, because Caltech Jet Propulsion Laboratories, everybody at Caltech wants to work on NASA. I'm like, where is it? And they said, oh, 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 like in the toolbox, listening is one of the tools. Like Caltech and listening, it's like an empty intersection. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh. Right? And then, you know, they were, I thought they were joking, and then they were kind of dead serious. They said, look, the people who are really good at sitting in the seat at Mission Control are humble people. And they're people who listen really, really well. And they tend to be people who didn't go to the elite schools, right? Which was kind of bad. Last one, all the evidence that, you know, so Google with their three and a half million applicants, McKinsey, I talked to the head of hiring from McKinsey's Global Institute. Um, I talked to um, White House Office of Personnel. Everybody who has all this data says, really there's sort of three things that determine success. You have to be able to solve problems because it's a cognitive economy. It doesn't mean math problems. It could be any problem. You have to be able to solve problems. Right? When I ask Andrew and David, like, why do you want to be university president, right? And they both said, because I love solving problems. Being university president, it's all about solving problems. 
working in groups, and continuing to add tools. So the people who are successful continue to add tools, continue to add tools. So there's a great quote by Jeffrey Specker, who's the chair of the New York Stock Exchange today, in the Wall Street Journal, saying, first he says, like, there's nothing I learned in chemical engineering that I apply directly, right? He's not like, basically doing the essays of chemicals, but he says, what it taught me is problem solving in complex systems and the way things relate to each other in business is just really that. Let me go back to this wisdom hierarchy, kind of in the last one. This is uh, Jesse Wisdom. And Jesse Wisdom was part of the Google People team that dealt with those four million applicants. And she and Laszlo Bach was the, the head of it. She was like number two. And now they work for a company named Humuno. Humuno doesn't actually have t-shirts. I just pasted these on their shirts for fun. <laughs> um, but what they do is they created this company that uses state-of-the-art AI to try and figure out like, how do you help people be successful. And one of the things that they really work on in, for this new company that they started, and this isn't meant to plug their company, it's just meant to plug this sort of idea of the wisdom hierarchy, is helping people continue to learn, continue to grow, to continue to add tools, and putting teams together where the people have large collections of tools. So to sum this up, I think, and we'll hopefully have some time for questions, people ask questions, is that it's so easy in this space to sort of be thinking of schools are ranked, children are ranked, I want my child to go to the best school. The best evidence, the most prestigious kind of places to be, the people who really make a difference in the world, I think are people who figured out, I want to find a place where I can find my purpose. And I want to find a place where, in addition to finding my purpose, I can accumulate the, school, the, the tools and understandings that enable me to be successful. And those tools that are going to, one of the tools that's really going to matter is the ability to sort of manage, work with, and collaborate with people from all sorts of places, right? Because talent doesn't know identity, talent doesn't know gender, talent, doesn't know anything else. And those are the people that are really changing the world and making things. All right, let me stop there. Thank you very, very much.